Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Welcome to today's study. As we return to the study in Zechariah chapter 5, we will review a bit of what we have had addressed this last week, but we need at this time to seek our Heavenly Father, to ask Him to guide us and help us in our conversation and our discussion about this book and about what is being presented for us at this time. Shall we now join together and seek his wisdom and his guidance as we come into this study? Shall we now pray? Loving Father in heaven, as we come before you today in these hours of the Sabbath, we ask, Father, for your guidance and your blessing. Direct us now, Father. Show us that that you would have us to do. Help us so that what is done and what is discussed may bring glory to your name, may honor your character, may help us to understand the message that we are then to give. We have sinned. The message that was to have gone has not gone. We need to understand the message so that we may truly represent you at this time in earth's history. Forgive us of our sins, we ask and we pray. Direct us now so that we may grow and become the kind of people that you would have us to be. May your angels surround us. May your spirit be with us. Help us now so that we may understand that which is being presented for us. We need you. We can do nothing without you. We thank you that you have promised that where two or more are gathered, there you will be also. We tremble to come in your presence. Direct us now. Guide us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, last week... We got to this point, we got a little further than this point, but we're going to recover part of what we were talking about. This manuscript, Manuscript 20 of 1899, is one of the non-published manuscripts. As Sister White had written, the events that are taking place on earth are critically watched in heaven, for by then human beings are being tested and proved. Every individual soul, if he would receive the seal of the living God must hear the word of the Lord and must do it with exactitude. What does that statement mean to us today? How can we approach this? Does this mean that being a member of the church is going to ensure our salvation? No, it's not. So salvation is an individual work. Would you agree? There must be no such thing as haphazard religion if men would have a place in the family of God. All who are brought into connection with God will be pure and holy. They will receive the holy oil from the heavenly messengers and will impart it to their fellow men. Now, when we read Zechariah 4, where is this heavenly oil coming from? The golden pipes. Yes. And to what does... Do these pipes empty? Do they not empty into a golden bowl? Yeah. Are we not representative of the golden bowl if we are purified? Okay. From the chat, I would have to say that an agreement has been made. The talents entrusted to men are not to be employed to please and glorify self, but to honor him from whom those talents come. And as these gifts of God are appreciated and valued and used, they will increase. The fullness of Christ awaits every receiver. Now, this statement is one to carefully consider. Can the fullness of Christ be poured out into a vessel that is not willing to fully follow 
God. Was the fullness of Christ poured out into Saul of Tarsus? And from the, from the chat, it was said that the fullness of Christ cannot be poured into those that are not willing to follow God. But was the fullness of Christ poured out into Saul of Tarsus? Compare this with the fullness of Christ in the Apostle Paul. Was the fullness of Christ poured into the Apostle Paul? I'd have to say yes, because he followed God. Okay, but would would it have been poured out into Saul of Tarsus? Hmm. That's debatable. Why? Why is it debatable? Well, because he didn't follow Christ, so I would have to say no. Okay. But they're the same person, right? So, oh, uh, Saul being Saul the Paul? Correct. Yeah, they are. The point that I'm, that, I, that I'm being led to drive at here. Here we have Saul. And his name is now changed to Paul. What is symbolized by a name change? Is that not a covenant relationship? Yes. So when Saul of Tarsus accepted the covenant with Christ and became Paul, he received the fullness of Christ. Our situation, brothers and sisters, is are we willing to enter into that covenant relationship? Are we willing to consider what is required of us to enter into the covenant relationship? Of our own selves, we are poor, but if we come to Christ and ask him in faith, we shall receive eternal riches. Christ stands waiting for us to ask him for the gift of the Holy Spirit. How is Christ waiting in Revelation 3? How does it say in the warning to the church of Laodicea? Behold, I what? Come quickly. Behold, I stand at the door and Christ is knocking today. Christ stands waiting for us to ask him for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We don't want to be told that the Spirit has been being poured out all around us, but hearts were unprepared to receive it. I may say, you will receive, but my word is not enough. You must take the words of Christ and understand his willingness to bless and strengthen and give to you the fullness of his riches. The more precious treasures of grace are discovered and drawn upon, the more anxious we will be for all to enjoy these heavenly riches. According to our capacity for understanding and appreciating these great gifts of God will be our ability to communicate, to enlighten the minds of those who are in the darkness of error. We are to draw from the inexhaustible source and gladden hungry, starving souls by presenting to them the living bread which comes down from heaven. Every man should consider himself of value with God because he has been entrusted with the richest gift that can be obtained. Is anyone, man, woman, child, of no value to God? All should consider themselves of value with God. The soul is thrilled with the love of Christ as it drinks deep from the inexhaustible fountain. This is the will of God concerning you, even your sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 Can you have sanctification without having experienced justification? Although our sins may be as a mountain before us. If we humble our hearts and confess our sins, trusting in the merits of a crucified and risen Savior, he will forgive and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As the soul yearns after God, he will find more and still more of the unsearchable riches of his grace. 
Now, in this situation, as we have been going through this for the last several weeks, we are presented with the symbol and the vision of a flying roll. We determined that this flying roll was written on both sides. What did we address the flying roll represented? Is it not the word of God? Well, the flying roll represented the names of those that had chosen to reject God. It was a flying roll with the names of all sinners. Now, we know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The flying roll represents those that stand in opposition to God. Does the flying roll represent those that are in danger of accepting the mark of the beast? Okay, from the chat. Yes, it does. Thank you. We must be justified. We must be sanctified. We need to understand that without this, we will be judged. The salvation of one soul reveals the depths of a Savior's matchless love. If all church members who have known the truth would accept this salvation, they would bear the testimony, we have redemption through his blood. The law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us and gave himself for us. Believing in him, we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Here, it is recommended that we see Ephesians 1, verse 7, Romans 8, 2 to 4, and 37, Titus 2, 14, 1 Peter 1, 8. So, if the flying roll represents all, and those that are in danger of accepting the mark of the beast, it is then only by faith in Christ that we are removed from that role. Would that be a correct statement? And would you agree with it? Now, the next document in this was also an unpublished document. I found this manuscript 64 of 1902 to be very interesting. Now, manuscript 64 of 1902 has in this paragraph, I dare not leave Nashville without presenting this message to those who have engaged in the strange work of hindering the Lord's servants. Men have had it in their power greatly to help the work in the South by being men of principle, honest with their brethren and with God. What a different showing there would be today in the Southern field had they fulfilled God's purpose for them. The neglect of this field stands as witness against them. Who's Ellen White addressing here? Is this a warning to the world? Did she expect the world to greatly help the work in the South? Not the world, but the, uh, the Adventist church. Exactly. So Mrs. White is being quite direct that this message who have engaged in the strange work of hindering the Lord's servants is being given to men of authority within the church. Yes, that's what it seems like. Where else in the Bible do we find a warning given to men of authority within God's church that are not following the path that God would have them to walk. Where else do we find this? Do you recall? Are you thinking of uh, Ezekiel? I am indeed thinking of Ezekiel. And to be specific, where would I be thinking of that within Ezekiel, brother? Uh, chapter 8. 
Can we not join chapter 8 and chapter 9? Chapter 9 would be after the close of probation. Chapter 9 would be a final warning to those within the church. Would that not be leading to the close of probation for the church itself? The way I read chapter 9, it's already there's the warnings been given. And it's okay. just a, a time of judgment. All right. <clears throat> Our point right now is within Ezekiel's warnings in chapters 8 and chapter 9, we are to start with this warning where. As Peter saw this, as we are looking at Ezekiel, where are we to first give the warning? To the church. And to what part of the church? Um, the, uh, the leadership. Exactly. And if the leaders will not hear it, then is the message to go into the membership. Well, yes. Now, in this situation regarding Nashville, to the ones that in, have engaged in the strange work of hindering the Lord's servants, Mrs. White paired that with Zechariah 7, verses 8 to 14. The word of the Lord came to Zechariah, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. And let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. But they refused to hearken, and pulled away the shoulder, and stopped their ears, that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it is come to pass that as he cried, and they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear saith the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them, that no man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. Zechariah 7, 8 to 14. Now, in the following paragraph, Mrs. White again repeats Zechariah 5, 1 to 4. Then I turned and lifted up my eyes and looked and beheld a flying roll. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. Then he, ans then he said unto me, This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For everyone that stealeth shall be cut off as on one side according to it. And everyone that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side according to it. I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of his house and it shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. In this particular passage, is Zechariah giving reference to the two tables of the commandments of Exodus 20. Yeah, the first and second uh, tab, uh, tablet. Because are we not told, thou shalt not steal? Yes. And are, we, are we also not told that we shall not take the Lord's name in vain? I mean, if if we're swearing according to the Lord of hosts, and we're swearing falsely by his name. Are we not dragging God's name into the mud? Yes. So in the situation where it comes to these 10 promises, is this not an example that if we forego one 
if we break one, we have now broken them all. Against every evildoer, God's law utters condemnation. He may disregard that voice. He may seek to drown its warning, but in vain. It follows him. It makes itself heard. It destroys his peace. If unheeded, it pursues him to the grave. It bears witness against him at the judgment. A quenchless fire, it consumes at last soul and body. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark 8, 36 and 37. Now in letter 123 of 1904, Mrs. White again repeats Zechariah 5, 1 to 4. Now what she states at the end of this quotation, every evil worker will receive at God's hand according to his works. Is a workman not worthy of his hire? I believe is a quote. So if we are working and not doing God's will, we are promised to receive from God himself according to the work that we have done. Yet, if we are working according to God's will, will we not receive greater than any riches that we would find in this world? I want your ambition to be a sanctified ambition so that angels of God can inspire your heart with holy zeal, leading you to move forward steadily and solidly and making you a bright and shining light. Your perceptive faculties will increase in power and soundness if your whole being, body, soul, and spirit is consecrated to the accomplishment of a holy work. Make every effort in and through the grace of Christ to attain to the high standard set before you. You can be perfect in your sphere as God is perfect in his sphere. Has not Christ declared, be ye therefore perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect. My apology. You are not to regard yourself as merely a passive recipient of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. How many times? Do we hear that all we need to do is accept Christ in our lives and then go about our lives as if there has been no change? Is that not a definition of being a passive recipient? Yes. No no substance. Okay. Was the Apostle Paul a passive recipient of the grace of Christ? No. No. Was William Miller a passive recipient of his grace? I'd have to say no. What about Martin Luther? I'd have to say no. Huss, Jerome, Zwingli, all of these reformers, were any of them passive recipients? No. Then what are we doing? God has entrusted to you precious talents and he requires the improvement of these talents interest from the principal lent is his due you are to be a worker together with him submitting your will to his will you will improve in speech and in spiritual conceptions you will be enabled to give the people through your prayerful efforts that which god has given to you what kind of a promise is this for us today It's an encouraging encouragement. Are we not told that we are to praise him in all things, even when we have things occurring that that we don't understand? Oh, yeah. Here we're being told we will be enabled to give the people through our prayerful efforts that which God has already given to us. There's a lot to be seen here in this Vision with the flying roll. There's a lot of admonitions that Mrs. White gives. For what we studied last week, we are to look at this 
with this portion of Zechariah, along with portions of Ezekiel 2 and Ezekiel 9. <clears throat> and I believe with Revelation 5. Does Ezekiel 8 or 9 represent a church that is working according to God's direction? Consider that carefully this week. Zechariah 5.5. 5. <clears throat> then the angel that talketh with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes and see what is this that goeth forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is an ephah that goeth forth. He said, Moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. Now, what is an ephah as far as Zechariah 5 6 is concerned? Well, it's a, a basket used for measuring uh, grain. Okay. Yeah, it's like when you talk like a bushel or something like that. Okay. Now, this is Hebrew 374. And when I'm looking at this using Esword, it says that this is a word of Egyptian derivation. Is there anything symbolically that we can derive from this basket, this measuring, being of an Egyptian derivation. What does Egypt represent when we are studying scripture? The world. Thank you. So here we have this measure of the world, the ephah that goeth forth. This is their resemblance through the whole earth. Are we being measured according to the world's standard or are we being measured according to God's standard? And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead. And this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. Why is this weighty piece, this talent of lead and this woman sitting in the midst of this Egyptian measuring. Does this talent of lead have great value as far as the world is concerned? Does it have value like silver? No. Does it have value like brass? Um, maybe, no. I mean, depending on how you're asking it. Well, I'm asking it in, in the realm of this verse. Here's lifted up a talent of lead. It's and weightier according, than lead or brass. What's that? I say it's, isn't it weightier than le, uh, brass? Well, if we're dealing with a talent of lead or a talent of brass, there's still a talent, right? Right. Just smaller shape. So, Zechariah is stating there was lifted up a talent of lead and this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. Is this being said that the talent of lead and the woman that sits in the midst of the ephah are equivalent? Yes. By the wording, yes. All right. What can we take from this? What symbols do we see here? Well, the woman of the church. Okay. Now, if we if we were to compare this with Daniel 2, the head of the figure in Daniel 2 was made of gold, right? Correct. So we go from gold to silver to brass to iron to iron. Iron with miry clay. Is lead ever used in the vision in Daniel 2? Doesn't seem as though. Now, when we look at various points in Revelation, are we not shown a woman in different configurations? Here is a woman 
sitting upon a scarlet colored beast. Here is a woman clothed with a crown of stars, two different representations of women. Here is a third, a woman that sitteth in the midst of an ephah that is being compared with a talent of lead. And he said, this is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and beheld there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and heaven. Then I said to the angel that talked with me, whether do these bear the ephah? And he said unto me, to build it an house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. Why is it necessary for us to understand that we have two women lifting up a talent of lead in a worldly measure? that is to build a house in the land of Shinar, in the land of Babylon. On what and how are we to learn from this? Any thoughts? Well, I, I have some thoughts, but they're... they're um, so, it's possible that this is not referring to an ephah at all. Okay. Um, because uh, there is a similar word... Um, which comes from uh, basically it would be a, a Babylonian word or an Assyrian word. Um, so it'd be an Assyrian word uh, that is um, referring to a, a, a worship house, a, a summit house, they call it. Okay. It's called Ipa in Aramaic or Assyrian, and um, um, and probably of Sumerian origin. Uh, It became a loan word word in the Assyrian language. And um, so this would be describing basically a woman that's to be worshipped and placed in Babylon. So this is about false worship. And uh, the talent is really just referring to a lid of lead. Right. So like a, you know, a circular lid that's placed on top. Um, So that's just an alternative interpretation of this. So this this ephah serves as a temple for the woman in the land of Shinar. That's the idea here. And it sort of makes more sense with what it's talking about. Um, but anyway, for whatever that's worth. Now, when we are looking at this word about the EFA, mm-hmm. when we are examining scripture as Father Miller had done, mm-hmm. Rule of first mention would take us back to Exodus 1636. Yeah. If it's the same word. Okay. I'm just saying that the suggestion is it's not the word Epha. Okay. Right. That this would be the only place this word is used. It's just spelt the same. Okay. So all of, all of these other methods, references to ephah within the torah would possibly be a different word yes that's the suggestion um and sometimes words do sound the same if you're bringing them from another language they might be similar to another word um i'm just looking at so i'm just looking at the spelling of it Okay. So when we look at, um, <clears throat> it's hard to tell. I don't have the vowel pointings or anything in this 
e-sword one, but um, so it is possible. It is. It is. It's possible. It's the same word, but this other explanation seems to make more sense in the context that it's like uh, an altar in which a woman would be placed upon to worship, like a, what do they call it a. Um, this would be part of the worship of Ishtar and stuff like that. So anyway, it's just an idea. I don't know if it's correct or not. Okay. The idea is that it would be like in an altar or a shrine that this woman is placed in. Shrine's probably a better way of describing it. So in Zechariah 5.11, and he said unto me to build it and house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base. Is this giving us an idea of establishment of a a church separate from that of God? Yeah, a false worship. It's interesting because this base, Hebrew 4369, is used only here, but it's supposed to be the same word as Hebrew 4350. Why would Zechariah choose to make use of this word versus the other? Well, um, why is it spelt differently? Is it but, spelt differently? Um, mm-hmm. But it's it's pronounced the same. One has a vav in the middle, the other one doesn't. So in this case, it uh, this one doesn't. But if you um, the four three five zero, it it generally does. Not always though, so I'm not really sure. Well, I'm asking this because it, it's interesting because the. Hebrew 4350 is in the feminine, and this one, 4369, Mekuna, they did not identify it as whether it was masculine or feminine. But yet, here we have set there upon her own base in this translation. Yeah, feminine singular. Now... Yeah, so I mean, there's the dispute in which which word it actually is to. Okay. Like Strong's puts um, four three six nine. Uh, Scholars Gateway has it is actually the other word, um, but I, I usually like the Strong's better. So the four three six nine instead of the four three five zero, especially based on the spelling, but. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments regarding what we've covered today? Any other observations? Okay, then shall we close our time together. Gracious Father in heaven, as we come before you, we thank you for these words of warning. We thank you for your great patience with us. Help us, Father, so that we may wake from this Laodicean condition so that our name will not remain upon that flying scroll. Guide us now. Please direct us. Show us that that you would have us to understand and that which you would have us to do. Be with us, we ask. Guide us, we pray. We thank you, Father, for the meeting that is to come next for the lessons that we are to learn so that we may become edified and understand what you would have us to know at this time. For this, Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.